Hello everybody, welcome back to Financial Trading Basics Part 39, Stock Market History. Uh, hopefully a little different episode today for this type of series. I do have some talking points, which we'll do at the end. Probably not enough for an individual episode itself, and just kind of some fun stuff. But I, want, I just wanted to go over just some the, the, the history of the stock market. Mainly the, the American Stock Exchange but maybe a couple other brief points on world history, maybe. But my, my federal and state tax returns were filed and accepted. I wrote was up there, sorry for the terrible grammar. Yeah, I'm sure you guys are all very concerned about that. But again, I sent the intake form on H&R uh, Block. I directly told them every, every bit of my finances but it's just, it's, again, it's just a question mark. It's just another bit of anxiety to sit unresolved in my head like, it is, you know, did it file correctly? Did it do this? Did it do that? I, I just don't know. And again, there's federal agents outside of my door literally every single night as I give lectures. So please just don't harass me. The thing I'm trying to do is not get harassed. If I had income, I'd, I'd pay every bit of taxes and not give one fucking shit about it. If, but I don't have, if, if I had more money, again, I just don't owe taxes. I have real fucking expenses. And so, again, you should probably teach that at school. You should probably learn how to do your own finances. And again, I do finance all day. I read your forms and then it says, an error, error. And then there's no one to contact after that because everyone's time is so valuable. My time is worth nothing. We need to create a fake, we need to create inefficiency in the market instead of educating our kids so we can start innovative business. So tax is done. Again, I'm buying a home. The thing about that, literally if I would have, again, I, I didn't, I kind of time it because the, like I sold the Bitcoin in, in December, early December. If that had been one month later, I would have qualified for the first time home buyers tax credit. I'm just so done thinking about money. I want to pay my actual money to get on a plane and leave this country and never step foot in the United States of America ever again. So again, there's just no way to function in this society because no one's competent and no one cares to teach anybody anything. It's a bunch of selfish squirrels saving their nuts for winter. But it's kind of hot in my apartment now. My, my air conditioning still has not been fixed, which is pretty cool, but it's rather temperate outside, so it's not a big, big problem. But, so I'm just on the New York Stock Exchange website, and I'm just going to read some of the major timelines of the stock exchange. But first, there was a couple, I have two different sources open here, in just about stock market timeline. And it says, this is on SoFi.com, which I believe is, a, is affiliated with Liz Young on uh, CNBC. And again, once again, in my most professional opinion, I'd love to get all up in that Liz Young. She is very cute, but I think she's affiliated with SoFi, but she's on, on CNBC all the time. But they have late 1400s, Antwerp, or modern day Belgium, becomes a center of international trade. Merchants buy goods anticipating that prices will rise in order to net them a profit. Some, some bond trading also occurs. 1611, the first modern stock trading is created in Amsterdam. The Dutch East India Company is the first publicly traded company, and for many years, it is the only company with trading activity on the exchange. Late 1700s, a small group of merchants made the Buttonwood Tree Agreement. The men meet daily to buy and sell stocks and bonds, a practice that eventually becomes to form the New York Stock Exchange. Now I'm jumping over to the actual New York uh, Stock Exchange website, nysc.com, and reading from here. 1790, the federal government issues 80 million in bonds to repay revolutionary war debt, marking the burst of the U.S. investment markets. Two years later, 24 stockbrokers sign the Buttonwood Agreement and eventually move to the Tontine Coffee House to trade. Other brokers continue trading in the street. 1830s, traders doing some business in the street come to be called curbstone brokers. Typically, the curbstone brokers specialize in the stocks of small, newly created enterprises such as turnpikes, canals, and railroads. 1840s, during the California Gold Rush, curbstone brokers made markets for mining companies, comma, facilitating development of a new and rapidly growing industry. 1850s, the curbstone brokers locate a market at the corner of Wall and Hanover Streets, semicolon, later at William and Beaver Streets. 1859, Petroleum is discovered in western Pennsylvania, and oil stocks are soon traded on the curb market. 1864, 
the open board of stockbrokers opens, founded in part by former curbstone brokers. It merges with the New York Stock Exchange in 1869. Sorry for doing my language videos, I'm pronouncing all of the, all of the commas and stuff, but that's just more, more to, to break off in the dictionary. Sorry for doing that. 1865, following the Civil War, stocks in small industrial companies, such as iron and steel, textiles and chemicals, are first sold by curbstone brokers. 1890s, the curb market moves to Broad Street near Exchange Place. 1904, Emanuel S. Mendels begins to organize the curb market to promote, to promote sound and ethical dealings. In 1908, the New York Curb Market Agency is established codifying trading practices. Uh, 1921, the New York Curb Market moves indoors to a new building on Greenwich Street in Lower Manhattan. New trading posts are topped by a globe that resembles the lamppost left behind on the street. 1944, the New York curb market is created with a constitution that sets higher brokerage and listing standards. Is that, oh, I admit, this is, why, why, did I, why did I get one from 1944? Sorry, I'm literally reading it right off of Wall Street, or New York Stock Exchange, so their, their graphic is not too clear. Going back to 1929, the New York Curb Market changes its name to the New York Curb Exchange. 1930, to meet increasing share volume, the trading floor is expanded to more than twice its size. The entrance to the exchange is moved to 86 Trinity Place. The Curb Exchange is the leading international stock market, listing more foreign issues than all other U.S. securities markets combined. 1950s, Radio Amex is launched to broadcast stock prices market index movements, and other market information. IBM punch cards are used to quickly obtain closing prices for broadcast. The Amex attracts a growing number of young entrepreneurial companies to its list. list. The value of shares listed on the Amex grows from $12 billion in 1950 to $23 billion by 1960. 1953, the New York Curb Exchange changes its name to the American Stock Exchange. 1971, the New York Stock Exchange and the Amex consolidate key automation and service facilities in a new jointly owned corporation, the Securities in Indus Industry Automation Corporation, SIAC. The Amex is incorporated as a not-for-profit corporation. 1979 to 1988, the trading floor is expanded to deal with the rising trading volumes in both stocks and options. Two balconies are constructed over opposite ends of the trading floor. A mezzanine trading level opens and, with the purchase of 22 Thames Street, the trading floor extends into the adjoining building. 1998, the Amex merges with the National Association of Securities Dealers to create the NASDAQ Amex Market Group. The Amex regains its independence in 2004. Oops, sorry, I missed 1993. 1993, the American Stock Exchange pioneers derivatives trading, derivatives trading with the introduction of the first exchange-traded fund, that legendary ETF. Standard and Poor's de Depository Receipts, SPDRs, nicknamed Spiders, the fund becomes the largest ETF in the world. 2008, the Amex joins the, United, the, the New York Stock Exchange group of exchanges, enhancing the company's position in the U.S. options, exchange-traded funds, and cash equities and offering a leading venue for listing and trading closed ends funds and structured products. I'm gonna give you some other final history, a lot of other cool stuff going on. But those were the major highlights. And additionally, again, shout out to Liz Young at SoFi. You could definitely sit on my face, excuse me. <laughs> Anything else from this one? No, I just wanted to get the other, like the, just mainly the American one, but a couple other points from the from the Belgium stuff. So that's pretty much the the history of the stock market in the United States. I don't, well that, that's directly from the New York Stock Exchange. I'm not really sure when the NASDAQ got into play. When, when did the NASDAQ start? So that was February 4th, 1971. How, how, many, stock, how many stock exchanges are there? How many, how many exchanges are there? How many American, American, 
stock exchanges exist? There's three major ones, the New York, the NASDAQ, what's the other one? The New York is the oldest and the largest. Um, well, it says there's 13 registered stock exchanges operating in the United States. NYSE is the biggest, NASDAQ's the second. That's, that's enough for that, not super interesting past that. Just my own personal curiosity. So there you have it. That's a brief history on stock market in the United States of America and some points about Belgium. But for my market minutes, just have a couple points. Does the Fed hiking interest rates interest rates affect supply chain inflation? I'm, I'm digging up some gold. I'm going to sell it. And does the, the interest rate of the Fed affect me digging up gold? No. No. So am I sure what causes inflation in general? Inefficiency. Again, inflation meaning I buy bread today for one dollar, tomorrow it's one dollar ten cents, that's ten percent inflation or dilution, right? More. So what what could cause a price increase? Decrease in supply, increase in demand, and some combination or commingling heterogeneous mixture of that. So that's about as specific as I can be. That's that's what causes inflation. Just completely bounded by supply and demand. But how about today? Like meaning like today's actual in the current environment right now today. Uh, it's, there's just a bunch, there's a bunch of shit going on. We got the war raging on, which is fucking sweet. We have again just incompetence. No one's no one's respected the United States Constitution. Everyone's stealing from me in mass en masse. Bonjour, bonjour, bonjour. <laughs> so how about today? I don't know. This is as 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 uh, Ben and. Uh, Josh Brown and Michael have been saying this is like the craziest investing period ever. Yeah, now I'm also in this environment. I don't have constitutional rights for 20 years. So yeah, it just gets way easier for me over here. It just gets way super easy. I got my, my Ritz Housing Holder Wealth Management clients. No, no I don't. I just have my money and no constitutional rights and I'm owed a lot more. So it's really fun for me over here, as we can tell in all of my videos. <laughs> So I'm not exactly sure what's causing inflation in today's environment in general, just to get a little more specific, just some sort of interaction between supply and demand. Elon Musk joins the board of Twitter, can't own more than 14.9% of the company. Why? I, I, just, I, don't, I don't know if that's because he owns a lot of other companies, I'm not exactly sure, just purely off of the statement, why you cannot own more than 15%. People do buyouts all the time. NVIDIA acquires, or Microsoft acquires NVIDIA, or I don't even know the market caps, who would be acquiring who, but for this amount of billion dollars, Elon Musk has lots of billions of dollars, so why couldn't he just buy the whole thing? But that, that, that's what I meant by why. What do I think about the transaction in general? I don't think it's meaningful financially, like size-wise financially for him, but the, the, again, the, social, the social, he's gonna do the most to promote free speech. Comedy. Fucking comedy. Nobody, nobody that is aware of my work is promoting free speech or free anything or any constitutional rights at all. So, yeah, he's going to champion free speech for all the, all the fucking idiots who just want to blurt out political talking points. Doesn't really matter. It just doesn't. No. Definitely not. So, I'm not sure why I can't earn more than 15%. I don't know if it's some SEC rule with some other companies or something. But I, I don't see that as very super meaningful. That's obviously been on the news. Fractional ownership investing. What do I think? Meaning, do I, as an investor, as an issuer of financial products, um, I think as an issuer of financial products, you'll probably get some more per participation. But as an investor or trader, I, I don't see the point. Why would I own, want to own one tenth or one one hundred thousandth of Berkshire A shares? Why would I not just buy options, right? So the barrier to entry, I mean, typically, I don't know, just random ballpark numbers, your average teenager is not gonna have 100 grand. Your average teenager is probably gonna have $1,000. And so if, if you can invest that properly in options, you can have $100,000 and $50,000 with a couple 
snowballing winning trades for real. So as an investor, I don't see the benefit of having fractional ownership. I'd rather just change my investing strategy and go with a different product. So as an investor, I would not, I don't, I, I see no point because again, it's the, whatever the underlying security is doing, that's going to your percentage. So Berkshire appreciates 10% and he owes one one hundred thousandth of that, you're going to make like whatever 10% divided by 100,000 is, or 100 divided by 100,000. So you're not going to, the appreciation is not going to be humongous. But right, it's like the, from the issuer standpoint, it's like, yeah, little Johnny, you can put your $30 and own a fraction of this. You know, again, they're like, they're like, there's plenty of companies you can own real, real share size. You can go buy penny stocks and own a couple million. Well, they'd have to be at the actual bottom to, to do that. But, but no, I think I'd say it's at the very, the lowest listed price, it'd still be 100 bucks for a million shares. So, uh, I, I don't, I don't see the, I don't see the draw. I don't see any financial interest from the investor standpoint to own fractional anything. Um, Mass Mutual, Children Baseball. No, I would, eh. How about like again, like the, I just watched the the Patrick Bet David with the, the the gold dude or not the gold dude. Yeah, his name's Golden, and he does like like I said the trading card, the trading card stuff. If you have an asset that appreciates a ton, if you own a, you know ten percent of some baseball card or something. Again, it would, it would just have to make sense in terms of like you know the potential risk reward, right? If you have ten percent of a baseball card that goes from ten k to hundred k, you're gonna make a good amount of money. I'm not doing the math off the top of my head. Calculations, calculation is not proof, and so you just have to make it know know what investing setup you're going for. But in, in general, I, I would I don't really see a benefit. Mass Mutual Children Baseball Commercial. This is another one. I want to give another shout out to another marketing department. There's a commercial, I'm sure you've all seen it, especially if you've been watching the CNBC. Little Johnny's up there swinging the baseball bat, going to run around the bases, maybe win some state championships. Hits the ball, or swings and a miss, and his mom's like, you'll get him next time, you can do it. And then there's a guy, a guy right after, like, you can do it, you probably can't. You'll get him next time, you probably won't. <laughs> but, you know, just talking about, you know, you'll, you'll have a career outside of sports. Which ironically, again, if you get scapegoated, you can't have a career at all. But again, I was swept up in the, the sports mania. The baby boomers who know how to come and try to like make some money and then compete over their kids. Yeah, it just did leaps and bounds of benefits for my life. But then, yep, yep, you can go pro in things other than sports. Old NCA saying, yeah, no, I can't even go to school and publish a paper. Just my constitutional right, still. So yeah, yep. Yep, unless you're a scapegoat, then you just want to die all day. So that's really fun. Yeah. Uh, and then last point, so I didn't, I didn't really have that many talking points today. But I, I, being too poor to qualify for poor people benefits. I'll tell you a funny story. So when I moved into this apartment again, like I told you, back on a liquid diet, I eat dinner fine. I just don't know why my fucking body weight's going down. It doesn't go down a lot. Like I, said, I don't like to be less than 180 pounds, and I don't really like to be like over 190, unless I'm like bulking or doing something can't lift weights properly, so I'm not bulking. <laughs> and so, so, so I just, but like I said, I, yesterday like I did my workout, had a little breakfast, did my workout, had a big protein shake, and then had a full, 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 like full size dinner. And so hopefully I'm over 180 today, who knows. But since, since, since when my, again, my, the, my cousin's wife, who has also now passed away, uh, husband, father, again, needed the cannabis and passed away. Then, and then I had that wonderful interaction with my mother. Since that time frame of like February, again, when Seema thrown the snowball at my back, to literally today, I've not been able to sustain eating properly, like regularly, confidently. And I eat, I eat fine, but it's it's a, it's a conscious thought to be able to feel safe enough to eat food. So yeah, you can go pro and other things other than sports. I can't eat properly. I can't. There's nothing I can do. I need to interact with my species to be able to eat food. So people, whenever these videos blow up and people really watch them, whoever, whoever is out there, your family members and your, your friends, family, business partners have been torturing me for, this is six, year six going on seven. Math subject on your desk. Prove, prove the foundations of science. Here it is on your desk. Well, we're still, we're still not gonna respect his rights to eat. Why can't you put me on an estate right now today? Why the fuck can't I get on a plane and go collect my money and you guys can do the same thing? We can do the exact same thing, except I don't hate myself and I can eat food. But. Is Brad Boas allowed to suffer? Yes, he is. Back to being too, being too poor to qualify for poor people benefits. 
So I moved into this apartment again after my, those wonderful interactions with Michael Jameson and Grafton Park not supplying me moving costs because they won't clear out a fly infestation and Lindsay Stevens getting all mad at me because she doesn't do her job properly. She's an entitled bitch, so fuck Brad. And again, I exist. I offend people for existing. Scapegoat. It's that simple every time. So I move into this apartment and I'm setting up my spectrum. Which, by the way, holy fuck, the past. Why do you guys bleep out? Oh, you guys are like, do you guys get demonetized if you swear? I only got 43 subscribers, so I, there's, uh, there's a lot of like podcasts with like like the the compound and friends. They'll, they'll just like bleep out swear words. Uh, does that get you demonetized or something? Or you're just trying to get more kid friendly? Yeah, I definitely don't. I say all of the nice words in my, my videos. But back to the story. Move into this apartment. Get Spectrum. Oh, Spectrum, like I said, hasn't been working. Like the past two or three days, like, if I turn on the TV seven times, it works maybe like twice. So Spectrum's really great service out there, not. And if, but I'm sure, remember, we went over the, Spectrum has no business charges. You get your bill, other charges, $17. Sweet. <laughs> but... I call up to set up my Spectrum, and there's a video, or it's a cable provider, if you're not aware of the company. And the, there's a dude telling me about, you know, because of COVID, there's a $50 uh, federal credit. You can say, you know, I made less than $100,000 last year. Here's, here's uh, $50 a month to uh, your, your, cable, your cable provider bill. And I think it was just like, specifically for cable. And so... So yeah, obviously I'm going to do that, and at the time because I did not make more than $100,000 when I moved into this place. I'm still living on a loan without constitutional rights because I can't get my company's value properly because of fraud. Fraud. Like actual real crime. Sweet. So I'm obviously going to apply for this, this $50 credit. And so I get onto this, this little uh, website, some federal website, and it's like, upload your social security benefits, your unemployment check, all of this paperwork for being literally poor. And I'm like, I don't have any of those things. I have a personal loan because I'm not allowed to access any financial products because once again, I don't have constitutional rights. So I, I had a, a genuine laugh. Again, this is when I moved into this place like end of July last year. <laughs> it was like, I was all hyped to get this $50 uh, cable credit because again, I never make money in my life because I'm not allowed to participate with the human species. And then it needs like documentation for being poor as fuck. And I was like, how do I like, I don't have anything. Like, I could never fit into the society. So it's like I never had any paper, so I couldn't get the $50 credit. Total tragedy. So that's about the end of this episode. And again, shout out to the marketing officer at Mass Mutual. I'm enjoying that commercial. Probably doesn't, he probably wouldn't get a bigger raise than the one at Reese's, but that's just my personal flavor. And again, shout out Liz Young and SoFi. So thank you for watching Financial Trading Basics, Part 39, Stock Market History.